Correct. I got the training based on analysis. All right. Uh, is that showing up? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I, I actually didn't know the kind of audience I was going to be presenting to, so I didn't know if I wanted to throw OT tableaus. Actually, I ended up deciding, regardless of who I wanted to present to, I didn't want to do that. So um, this is going to be a general descriptive analysis of the evolution of the imperfect. Um, and I'm going to talk about ident constraints and some stuff. But um, if you're not familiar with, actually, who's familiar with OT? You know, a couple of people. OK. Everyone else, that's totally fine. I deliberately, ho hopefully, this should make sense to everyone who doesn't know anything about OT. Um, and I definitely. Uh, okay, so anyway, so ba is the imperfect marker in Latin. Uh, if you look at a Latin paradigm, pretty much no matter what, you have ba for every imperfect person and number, so amabam, amabas, amabat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Words that Latin students have been repeating, wrote for hundreds of years. Um, so that's pretty expectable. It's a very regular paradigm. Uh, it marks pretty much every verb, uh, one exception for esse, the copula, uh, and that's expected. If you're going to have an irregular verb, it's going to be the copula. Um, so something weird happens specifically in Ibero-Romance, Spanish included, Portuguese, Galician, uh, Catalan, you know, all, all the ones you typically think of. And that is, so this is pretty normal, so amabam becomes amaba, uh, amabas, you know, all this stuff is regular sound change. You lose the T in the third person, that's totally normal. Uh, the U in the second plural, or excuse me, the first person plural turns to O, oh, that's normal, this is all expected. Um, but something weird, well, that's just AR stem verbs, right? So this is the, the low vowel class. That's all normal, this is just like nor or apparently normal sound change. Uh, but of course, Spanish has two other verb classes, the ER and the IR verbs. Uh, and when in Latin, the B is marking every single verb in the language, so you have dikebam or dicebam, that becomes decia in Spanish. Um, and pretty much the same with all other Iberian, Iberian languages. Um, so you have that, of course, across the entire paradigm. Um, so this is, I guess, interesting because what you have is you have a, a regular paradigm and you have some cha sound changes in some way applied to it and it becomes irregular. Uh, so you have, again, the low class vowel, the AR class, they retain B in all the other classes, you lose it. Uh, pretty simple. Uh, so if you're a Spanish learner or a Spanish teacher, the rule of thumb is, so you use ba with AR verbs, EL with everything else. Um, so it's relatively predictable, not too irregular, but it's a little strange that it's even there in the first place. Um, so the, I guess, possibly surprising thing is the, the chebam to decia. That's actually the regular expected sound change if you apply the sound shifts between Latin and Spanish. This is the thing that's expected. Um, because you have a general loss of intervocalic voice plosives, so legere becomes leer, cadere becomes taer, et cetera, et cetera, or frididon becomes frio, which is a good one because you have two voice plosives for disappearing. So this is a general uh, shift. There's a general lenition of basically everything intervocalically in Western Romance. Um, so, uh, oh, well, I should say uh, all of these are with G and D. Uh, you're not going to find many examples with B outside of the imperfect. That's just because in Indo-European, for different reasons, there are very few B sounds in Latin. Uh, and that has to do with glottalic hypothesis or something. But that's another topic for somewhere else. Um, just know that there are very few Bs, uh, so we don't have many examples of it happening. Um, so the question is, if you have the kebam to decia, why do we actually maintain the B in the AR class verbs? Um, and if you rephrase that, it might actually make more sense. So if you have dikebam become desia, why not amabam to ama or something like that? Um, and when you put it that way, it should be a little obvious. There's something going on. Uh, either Spanish is trying to avoid hiatus, uh, so you don't want to have ama a with like some kind of hiatus or glottal stop, or it's trying to preserve meter. Uh, so Spanish, of course, is a uh, so-called syllable time language, depending on your definition of that. So maybe Spanish is trying to con conserve that. Well, in decia, you still have that sort of Latinate syllable structure with three different uh, things uh, or vowels. Uh, you don't have that in uh, a hypothetical form, ama, for the imperfect. Um, but if you look at other Romance languages, this is not a universal tendency. Uh, it's strong in Spanish and Iberian. Uh, Ibero Romance languages, it's not universal. Um, so if you look at Romanian, for example, Romanian is sort of the opposite of Spanish in that, uh, well, first off, Romanian is weird because it's like the only Romance language where you have no good amare verb, so you, you have to use adorare, 
Um, so, which of course means exactly what it sounds like. Uh, so adorabam becomes adoram, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The S to I, that's a normal transformation in Eastern Romance, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but of course, what you have is a total loss of the B and the A. So what happens is the B is lost and the A coalesces in some way. Um, so Romanian and Eastern Romance languages, they actually don't have the same transformations Western Romance has where, where they allied everything. Uh, but in situations, in sort of morphological paradigms and in, in uh, 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 post-tonic syllables, you have sort of the same thing happening. Um, and of course, you can look at you know the dicere uh, verb as well. Uh, you have pretty, I mean, the D to Z is expected in this situation, but you see that you don't retain the B uh, in any of these. Now, Italian, of course, is the, the other leg of the tripod, so to speak, in that, of course, you don't lose anything. So uh, Italian, basically, Bs become V, and everything is retained. So you retain the, the meter here, and you retain, uh, you don't actually lose anything in any verb class. I'll just skip through those. Um, so to generalize what we've talked about so far, so Spanish, you have... Uh, Spanish and other Iberian Romance languages, you have partial loss of uh, the B. Romanian, total loss. Uh, Iberian, well, you change it to a V, but it's totally conserved. Um, okay. So traditionally, in a, a sort of rule-based account of a phonological change, what you would have is each language, when you, you know, each language basically performed a different sound change on its, you know, funnel, its morphological inventory. Um, so each one, it, you know, the speakers of Spanish would have a morphological rule that said, okay, well, we lose B in this situation, not in this situation. Or Romanian would have one that universally loses it and coalesces vowels. Italian would have another one. Um, but that's a little strange because what's going on is phenomenologically the same thing. Um, so it's a little weird to say that there are all of these similar sound changes that are occurring all over the Romance Sprachbund, uh, which are sort of the same and sort of different, but we have to model them formally as being totally different animals. So it'd be nice if there were just one way of unifying um, all of this change. Uh, so how do we do that? Um, now, uh, of course, we, uh, one can do that with constraints, OT, something like that. So in case you're not familiar, uh, traditionally in linguistics, since you know, the classic Sanskrit grammarians, everything has been rule-based. So you take a, an underlying representation of a sound, you perform operations on it, intervocalic flapping, inter, or excuse me, intervo, yeah, or intervocalic voicing or something like that. A lot, a lot of different operations occur on an underlying form until you get to whatever we actually say, which may be totally different. Um, while, of course, during you know, the past couple decades in formal phonology, there's, there's been a shift to the constraint-based view where there's an underlying representation, and what determines how you pronounce that isn't necessarily a sequence of rules, but it's different constraints, like this particular sequence is difficult to pronounce, uh, you know, I want to conserve loyalty to an underlying form, uh, you know, I want to avoid this or I like this. There are different constraints and the differences between languages are ultimately the differences between what constraints they like more than other ones. Um, so we can model the difference in Romance languages like this. Um, so we can formalize these, the, these uh, names aren't very religious or shouldn't be taken religiously. Um, so we can think of the Linnitian tendency as just a constraint, and I'll talk more about this later. This isn't the way you should formally formalize it, but I'll just call it Lin for now. That is, at some point in time, there's go, there's a phonological shift uh, that sort of doesn't like the intervocalic voiced sounds and wants to get rid of them. Um, uh, aside from that, there are countervailing tendencies. So there's the tendency to conserve each sound as it's represented. So you don't want to lose. There's there is a, a part of the language faculty that says, I don't want you to get rid of sounds. Uh, you know, that, that's a constraint as well. Um, and also, uh, there's a tendency to preserve meter, like what we saw in Spanish. So uh, I'll call this max syllable, but you could formulate this in different ways. It, the, what you call it isn't super important. Um, so if you put it this way, you actually see the differences between Romance languages are really just uh, the differences in what constraints they prioritize. Um, so in Spanish, you have a very strong preference for preserving syllable structure. So you, you want to have, that's the most important thing, even if you have this really seductive sound change, you don't want to lose that syllable structure. Um, so max, or excuse me, uh, Spanish prioritizes max syllable, that's number one. Number two is lenition, they'll lenide if it doesn't violate the first thing, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, and last constraint is max, and this, uh, the last max is in reference to B. So they don't really, they care about bees theoretically, but not as much as they would like to do the lenition, the, the sound change. 
Um, now, a Romanian just has a different order. So their priority is lenition. They don't care if they have to bulldoze over different you know, metrical feet or something like that. They don't care about that. They just want to get the sound change done. Uh, in Italian, I only have two constraints here because the max syllable constraint actually doesn't even matter uh, in this situation because uh, Italian just wants to keep that uh, B or V, it wants to keep some kind of uh, consonant there. Uh, and we can't actually tell where max syllable is in this situation. Uh, but the, so the difference here is, so well, I should say, what's the essence of the sound shift? Um, it, the sound shift is really just a higher prioritization of the Lin constraint. So what happened diachronically, uh, you can simply say, instead of different language communities learning different sound changes, what happened formally is just Lin became higher prioritized in all languages. Now, what you did with that depends on what other constraints, whatever language community, whatever Sprach one actually happened to like. Um, so as generation, and it should be said, as generations go by, people lose this underlying representation of B. So no Romanian speaker today thinks of there as being a B in the imperfect. There's no such thing. Um, so since that's the case, you no longer have to think about this constraint that's you know, theoretically liniting it. It becomes unimportant. Uh, so the whole game sort of becomes reset. So you can actually have, um, yeah, so nowadays Lin is actually, could be ambiguous. Um, but you can sort of have the same shift happening again, actually synchronically in Spanish. Uh, some speakers exhibit uh, an alternation that looks like this. Um, so you have the word hablado, uh, which some people will seamlessly pronounce hablado. That's no big deal for them. Um, but on the other side, with respect to hablada, very few, I don't know, I don't, there might be someone who does this, but I don't think uh, anyone says habla, or totally lenighting the, the, the D. Um, and, but this is exactly the same thing. So you have a continue, a new uh, lenition process, but in the same way that Spanish prioritized that syllable uh, maintenance, it's still doing it today. Um, so in some sense, you can make predictions of how sound changes permeate through a language based on the general constraints that they still might be prioritizing. Um, so I should say, what is, how much time do I have? Um, eight minutes. What's that? Eight minutes. Okay, great. Um, so I should say, what, what exactly is Lin? So I've just said there's a lenition process that happens, and I've said that's a constraint. So that's terrible to do in optimality theory, I, even though people do stuff like that all the time. Um, but uh, that's theoretically not something you want to do. Um, and I'll put it this way. So traditional OT had these things called ident constraints. So an ident constraint is basically a con constraint that says, don't change uh, word, don't train, change phonemes, okay? So if it's underlyingly a B, you want it to be a B. Or you could have it refer to specifically voice, so don't change voice, or don't change place of articulation, any of those things. Uh, that's generally what an IR, or excuse me, an ident constraint is. Um, and so they tie how you pronounce things to the underlying form and vice versa. Um, so for example, if you have an underlying B, uh, it is bad to pronounce that as B. That's just, you don't, you don't like that. Now this, ident constraints are a classic part of optimality theory. It's used everywhere. Um, but I think it's in interesting to think about what are ident constraints really for. So one thing I think that's hard to get through your head is that the phoneme B is not a voiced bilabial plosive. The phoneme B is an abstraction. Uh, it is something that theoretically exists in your head. It, there are some words that have B in it and they are networked with all the other words that have B in it. And we use those phonemes to distinguish the, word, the, uh, the words with B from the words without B. So bat and vat are different words. Uh, and that's not, we don't necessarily need bat to have a bilabial plosive. There's nothing essentially about that, it's just conventionally we use these, this particular pronunciation to dif differentiate classes of words. Um, so the voice bilabial plosive is something that exists on the surface representation. Um, so ident constraints, they're, they've sort of been cheating all this time and saying that there's some way in which all of these features are sort of part of your, you, all these articulatory features are part of what's actually going on in your brain. Um, but I think if you really think of what ident constraints are formally doing, is they're keep, as I said, they're sort of keeping different words to different categories. So the reason we want an ident constraint is so we can dis distinguish bat from vat or other words like that. You want to keep different words 
uh, sort of in the, in the, the pile they belong in. Um, and so B can, the phoneme B conventionally rules the sound B and everything around there in each phoneme, you know, has its own sort of territory. Um, and the important thing is not necessarily that they keep preserving that exact sound, but that they keep distinguishing words. And that's sort of the important information theoretic uh, part of it. Um, so, but the thing about it is that goal of ident falls apart. Uh, like there's no reason to conserve, conserve a historical pronunciation if you have something like a chain shift or if you have no other words that you're distinguishing. Uh, so for example, and of course in Spanish at the time or in Western Romance at the time and in some portions of Eastern Romance, you have a general chain shift. So you have uh, gutta becoming gota, uh, you know, toto becoming todo. Uh, you have the general shift, so, you know, uh, reduplicant, or excuse me, um, long consonants become just plain uh, voiceless stops, voiceless stops become voice stops, uh, voice stops become, uh, you know, I, they either lanide or historically they go through fricative phases or something like that. Um, and I guess in, in Spanish, uh, todo is the fricative, depending on your definition. Um, so you have this general shift of everything in the whole language in a particular direction. Uh, in a particular direction. So if you think of it this way, when a chain shift gets in motion, if you want to distinguish words, it's good to follow the chain shift. It's good to actually keep that sound distinct by changing how it's been historically pronounced. Um, so if you really think about it, this is ident doing what it's supposed to do, but it's sort of, I'm turning it upside down. So what I'm trying to say is what I modeled as being a tendency to lenition, you can just actually model it as being an ident constraint if you understand that differently. It's really just the tendency for languages to differentiate different words. It's just sort of in motion. So it's actually doing the opposite of what it historically did, but with the same goal, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, in conclusion, so just a recap, I guess. So descriptive uh, status of the imperfect, how it looks in different Romance languages. Uh, we can treat sound changes generally as uh, sort of shifts in constraint orderings. And because different languages have different uh, prosodic constraints, they can respond to sound changes differently uh, across different languages, but they can also you know, respond to sound changes systematically the same way as they occur. So when you have chain shifts or when you have something, we mentioned the hablao thing in Spanish, when you have a shift like that occurring, it's understandable that if what's going on synchronically in a language looks like what it was doing 500 years ago, because a lot of the constraints of the language, a lot of the prosodic desires are going to remain the same. Um, and ident, as I said, had many faces. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, that's it. So um, any questions? <laughs> Yeah. Have you looked at any study that actually um, um, analyzed and counted um, sound deletion in, in, in words like hablada and parada, things like this, where you would have two as encountering these uh, sound stimuli? Uh, nothing, nothing synchronically. Uh, yeah, because I was just saying, I was trying to find that they do. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it depends on, I guess it's the, an issue of like how uh, far gone the, the, the uh, sound shift is going right now, mm -hmm. um, but right. It, yeah, I mean what, what I'm trying to say is it's going to be formally similar to what has happened before, right. uh, but I, I don't know how it is now, I just use it as an example. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. And it could be that it's, you know, fewer cases than the ones that have at uh, all, oh, it could be. Yeah, it's just I, interesting to see if synchronically you find the same pattern. Yeah. Well, would you, do you have the intuition that people say hablado Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I think they, they do that. They do that okay. too. Yeah, especially parody and Spanish. Language. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll check into that. And maybe another scene too. Yeah. 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 yeah all you guys surprised with D and then you got habla. Especially in, in, in particles, yeah. 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 It's like, uh, Chilean Spanish, they say, like, Wea, Julia. Yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, oh. Which that even like, well, not that it's, it's relevant, but like even orthographically, they do, they, uh, yeah. they don't even write the second A, they just wea, sometimes they write like W E A with an accent over it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, my, my general framework here wouldn't necessarily not predict something like that, but I, I do think there's a, my intuition is there's definitely a tendency for 
it happened more often than we have allowed. Um, so, uh, any deep optimality theoretic question? I'm watching. Okay. Is there still time? Huh? Uh, is there still time? Yeah. Of no course. So your your assertion that like Lynn and I are the same is that like the less technical way of like merge or, or <laughs> the OT way of, uh, of trying to preserve a phonemic contrast. Yeah, exactly. So I you know I was thinking of different ways of doing that in OT. Uh, it's it's sort of hard, um, other than me just sort of saying I think that's the goal of what I then is supposed to be. Yeah. Um, but the problem with it, the problem in implementing it is because I'm uh, you basically have to say every single phoneme is sort of connected to every other phoneme. Mm -hmm. uh, that causes really big OT tableaus. Uh, that's what you need OT help for. So, um, but um, yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure that how to implement this um, like as a general. I mean, there are people there are people in my department who actually do this stuff. Uh, Andy Wiggle, for example, um, does this stuff where sound change is motivated by contrasts. So like if you have a lot of you know two sounds that are very highly contrasted in a language, you're not going to lose the distinction between them. But if you have you know two sounds that you know it's, the distinction isn't very important for a couple sounds, yeah, you lose those all the time. And that's sort of the same intuition I have mm -hmm. here. Um, yeah, well, but doesn't that, that kind of apply to the, the participle situation that we're talking about? Like your the the, the two vowels in the late and ablau yeah. is you have two very distinct vowels that are making something different, whereas when you delete that D in the participle in Ava, yeah. you, you have the two same vowels, so the same kind of asymmetrical relationship. So yeah. if, if I have a distinction, big distinction, I'm not gonna oh. not gonna lose it. But if I have a smaller distinction, then maybe it will. Yeah, well, it's, it's working it's, in the opposite direction. Yeah, right? well, it's case, right. but yeah, no, yeah, you're you're right. I, it's not exactly what I was getting at, though. Like what I was getting at is like, uh, so we have a distinction in English. Dilution versus delusion. Uh, it's one of the only minimal pairs of sh and j. So that's a good place for us to lose that distinction theoretically. Um, the, so the idea is comparing different words and like how many, where did they actually contrast or something like that. But um, yeah, I mean, with, with respect to what you said, um, yeah, there is a tendency because the vowels are different, you can diphthongize them or something like that. Um, and again, most languages really despise hiatus and they really despise like if Spanish were to implement like a, a super long vowel that would be a huge shift in the phonology of everything like speakers would have to learn this entire new category um, but um, you know and there are languages that are, that are different as well so ancient Greek random example happens to love vowel hiatus they're just like I, ancient Greek is the weirdest language that actually is like there's a semi-vowel between those vowels I'm going to get rid of it just because this is how it is I'm thinking in Portuguese you have the um, appositions of the a uh, article together, and it does it. So you have a uh, uh, but you don't do a uh, uh, it just simplifies to one vowel. Yeah. Uh, um, and, I, and I'm thinking that would be a much better solution than capable of them. Yeah. Yeah. In general. Yeah, I, I think if they have if they have no no kind of epithetic thing that they can put between them. Then they merge. Yeah, it, it, and the same thing, of course, happens in Romanian. They don't want to have adoram, they say adoram yeah. instead. So, yeah. right. Okay, thank okay. you. Great, thank you.